So now, the topic tonight, as you all know, dependent arising and compassion. <laughs> dependent arising and compassion. Well, I thought to say a few words about some things I've noticed in general with regard to the challenges of learning about the Dharma and about the challenges people seem to face in Singapore after those short days, the short time I've spent here, the challenges seem very similar to Europe and America. Although being a Buddhist country traditionally, some of those challenges are just not found. But the first point I wanted to make is that it is very difficult initially to learn the Dharma only because of the words. There's a lot of strange terminology. And so you face that also when you learn in Tibetan, when you study in Tibetan, even as a Tibetan. Um, in Tibetan, the challenge is that the terminology is not the terminology, the Dharma terminology are not the words you use in everyday life. In English, you have the challenge, you use the words that you use in everyday life. So in both cases, it's difficult. So the study that we traditionally do in the Tibetan Buddhist tradition is therefore described in, in, in Tibetan. What is, the, what is the name of the study? How is it described? Does anyone know? The study of... Go ahead. Definitions. The study of definitions. So there you go. We learn about how do you define this? How do you define that? So it's the study of definitions, because many of those ideas, although not totally strange, are s slightly new. They have s some ideas are very new. Some ideas are n are we kind of familiar with, but we don't fully understand. Okay. So please be aware that some of the difficulties is just we use an English word that actually means something different to us. It is close enough, but it doesn't describe it completely. So I'll try and give you an explanation of the words I use. I try not to use too much technical uh, terminology. But just also be aware that this could be an obstacle. Another obstacle I've noticed is that people seem to think it's so much. Where do I start? Where do I start? It's overwhelming. Well, that is true even after so many years of study. <laughs> There's still so much left to do. It's still overwhelming. I never feel I'm done. <laughs> I mean, a lifetime is not long enough. Two are not long enough. It's an endless process. But it's not about collecting information, of course. It is just receiving teachings that then, to your best of your ability, to the best of your ability, you put into practice until you gain first and experience of all the theory. That is theory for us right now. What we learn is theory. For a Buddha, it's praxis. For a Buddha, this is his or her reality. And they're just telling us what they've experienced in different ways. So for us, initially, it's also theory, but then we turn it into praxis. So, therefore, where do you start? It doesn't really matter. It's not like in the Tibetan traditions, they all start with the same thing. In some traditions, they start with slightly different texts, for instance. They go into different texts. In the Gelugpa, the Nyingma, they focus on different texts. And in the end, it doesn't matter. You start maybe where your interest lies, or you start with those teachings you personally find most beneficial. And then you go from there, and you also learn how to connect everything you learn. But of course, what's most important is you put it into practice. Which takes me to the next point. This is one of my favorites. When in the West, 
I mean, in, in Europe and the United States, they often tell me, but we live in the real world. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, there you go. <laughs> but you don't know. We live in the real world, the normal life, right? Mm. So you live in nirvana kind of life. <laughs> We live in the real world. <laughs> in the West, this is quite strong. Oh, you people, you don't live in the real world, you know? There is this tendency. But actually... I think there is a misunderstanding here because when we talk of nirvana versus samsara. Nirvana, everyone kind of knows what nirvana means. Something nice and peaceful, desirable. And then we talk about the state we are in right now called samsara. So the state that is influenced by our negative emotions, by our fear, anxiety, by our suffering. And so there's this idea, there's this place that is more samsara and this place that's less samsara. But actually, samsara is our own mind and we carry that mind with us. So it's also for us as nuns a big surprise that you take on vows, you wake up the next morning and your mind is not wearing any robes and you haven't shaved off the afflictions They're there as before. Okay. So, okay, without hair, you don't face bad hair days. <laughs> That's a plus. I haven't had a bad hair day for many years. Okay. But then with the robes, I, give, I tell you a secret. There are many shades of maroon. <laughs> so many shades to, prove, to choose from. No, but it does make life easier in terms of the haircut, the, the style of life, the clothing. It makes things easier. But we bring our samsara right into the nun's life. So Buddhist centers, I don't think in Singapore it's like that. I'm not sure. But in the West, people think Buddhist centers are very peaceful. It's nirvana. <laughs> Monasteries and nunneries, ah. Oh, People are levitating over through the neck. <laughs> no, not necessarily that, but they think everything is going so harmoniously. The real world of stress. No, it's some, it's samsara in the sense that there are people who carry their, bring their own samsara into the monasteries. And even you have the high lamas, right? So if you have a Buddha going into, I don't know, a Gucci store, It's nirvana. The garbage bag, nirvana. The Buddha center, nirvana. So their perception is different because basically it comes from their own mind. So therefore, samsara is where we are. I have my own personal and you have your own personal. So th this is why Buddhist practice, remember she said it very beautifully yesterday, What do I do? Where do I practice? What do I do with the Dharma? I take it to work. I thought that was a beautiful sentence. I'll take it to work. It's not like the moment I leave my shoes outside, I leave the real world outside, and now I start practicing. No. I take whatever I learn here, I take it with me. It's a bit like when you do yoga practice or any kind of exercise, You take that body that is now more flexible, you take it with you to your daily life. And when you walk up and down stairs, you watch your posture, you watch what you've learned. So here, instead of physical posture, you watch your mind and you apply what you've learned. And it's a great, a great br um, ground for practice. So many teachers to practice patience with, to practice compassion with, to practice generosity with. Yes, it can be overwhelming, right, of course, but it's perfect. So therefore, when people I hear people say, but I don't have time, I don't have to work, 
right? I don't have to work. I have, don't have time to practice. But this is the practice, the Dharma practice. And when you look at the lives of monks and nuns, even if you're up in a silent cave with just birds around you, you are with your own mind. That's very stressful. So <laughs> that, that's why... That's why people do it. Oh, yes, they're still sweet. Yes, hi. <laughs> so this is why people go into the solitude, because they want to be with their own mind to just deal with those emotions on such a level for some time before they're ready to deal with their own mind, of course, with others. So there's so many opportunities. And you take your time off, you're on your own, you digest, you collect yourself, and then you go out again. So it doesn't matter whether you're a lay person or a monk and nun, you just bring it, you bring the Dharma with you. So, and so therefore I would like you to ask you something. When we go through some ideas of philosophy together here, all of us, I want you to do one thing from your side, to be very, very critical and skeptical and check Does this make sense with regard to my own life? And if not, why not? And when there's time to ask questions, I'd like to leave them more towards the end. But nonetheless, when there's time to ask, to voice those, those concerns or those common, as in like contradictions that you can see. So to be very skeptical. This is how we were trained to not take anything for granted. And also, of course, to understand, and this I'm just saying to those who are possibly new, Buddhism is not about anyone calling him or herself being a Buddhist. The Buddha doesn't care what you call yourself. In the end, is to be happy, to find happiness. Basically, the idea of Buddhism is our suffering is a waste of time and unnecessary. And it's only because we created unnecessary causes that we just can't help that we have certain emotions and eventually then suffer. And it's totally unnecessary because there's a way to overcome this. That's what Buddhism is all about. So everything else, the statues, the worship, all this are techniques to bring more happiness, that's it. In the end, they all serve as techniques. They all have some psychological background. And sometimes Buddhism is described as a science of mind. I want to call it that and go further. You know, when you take uh, the field of medicine, take the field of medicine, you could say that is the science of the body. But it's more than that. It's using the science of the body to treat illness, to treat something that is not supposed to be in your body. So Buddhism is a science of the mind, but it's more than that. You use the science, the understanding of the mind, to treat the mind, to remove something that's extra, that's not supposed to be there. It's not natural, if you like, to suffer. Why? Because those causes that are responsible for our suffering are not in the nature of the mind. They're extra. And we have everything already to be enlightened. Everything is already there. We just need to remove what's extra. Those negative emotions, misperceptions, If we can remove those, then that leads to happiness. And it's basically not, and I'll say more about this, but not understanding how we really exist, therefore we suffer. Therefore we find it hard to be kind and compassionate. We can do it. It makes us happy. We are happy seeing others being kind and compassionate, which shows this is how it's supposed to be. In fact, we are raised on kindness and compassionate, plus food. 
and diapers. <laughs> right? But those are the basic things we need when we grow up. Diapers, food, right? And love and compassion. Okay. So, but we, we need it. We can give it. But we get it in limited portions and we can only give it in limited portions. Why? Because of our in the because of our obstacles right now, obstructions right now, which come from the misperception of reality, of things, of how things really exist. So this is what I want to start with. The topic for today is dependent arising and compassion. Why those two? I could have chosen something else. I chose those two. Dependent rising and compassion. Do those two remind you of two aspects you find in Buddhism? Can you think of something? There's like when you divide Buddhism into two, you know, Buddhism in, into the Tibetan tradition, they love to classify and divide, right? To just make it a little bit more comprehensive. Can you think of a division into two which is in accordance with this division of Dharma into dependent arising and compassion, or with these two aspects. Yes? Method and wisdom. Method and wisdom. Okay. Now just turn them around. Wisdom and method. Dependent arising is part of wisdom. Compassion is part of method. There you have it. Okay. So, wisdom and method. Now why are those two important? They speak to our basic psyche in the sense that we live our lives, to summarize it, okay, whether in the real world or the, the world of the, the, the monasteries and nunneries, nunneries and Buddhist centers, I'm kidding, like whatever we do as ordinary people, we live our life by a sense of how things are, we have a sense of how things exist and we use analysis to some degree, have a sense of how things exist and out of that sense certain emotions arise. So how does that work? My sense of reality. I don't know about your sense, you could all be enlightened for all I know. I know I'm not, that's all I know. So in my case, let, te let me tell you my reality. I'm the center of the universe. Me. I perceive there an I. Very solid. Very solid I. At times it's here or here or here. It's never in my elbow or my kneecap. It's usually somewhere in this area. So there's an I. Very strong I. And because this is the I and you are others, you're always others. Now, if you call yourself I, that's a little bit weird because actually you're others. <laughs> I'm I. So, and this I, because it's here, is just a little bit more important than you are. Sorry. Just live with it. Nah. <laughs> no, it feels, right? I am just a little bit more important than everyone else. My happiness is more important. My family is more precious. My country is a better one. My house is more important. An earthquake strikes the neighborhood. Sad, but my house is all right. Okay, <laughs> right? Okay, so anyway, I don't need to go into a lot of detail because I'm sure you get what I'm saying. So everything goes, I, right? I am so, therefore, now people act. Now you harm me, and an emotion arises. But actually, if you check, we never get angry without a reason. If you tell me, I'm a jerk, I'm stupid, I don't get angry right away. I start thinking, how dare they? They say that to me. <laughs> Last week, I helped them. I actually was very kind to them. And that's how they, that's how they repay me. There you can go. People are so selfish. <laughs> no, that's just unacceptable. Okay? 
And so it goes on and on. And the emotion, anger, arises. Not without a reason. It takes a while, a few seconds. I'm quite good at anger, you know. It doesn't take me too long. But there's some time in between. And then if someone does something good to me, makes me feel good, tells me how wonderful I am, which I already know, but, you know, I like to hear it. So over and over they tell me, oh, you're so wonderful, right? And they make me feel good in so many ways. <coughs> so then I think, oh, this person is really good for me. It brings out my true self. <laughs> <laughs> they really understand me. <laughs> right? Oh, they're so good. They're so amazing. And then attachment arises. Not immediately, but after some time. See? So you see this process. It's a very basic process. But of course, actually, if we check, and this is why it's so funny, right? If you check, check, it's actually exaggerated. I started off with an exaggeration of the eye. I exaggerated the existence of some solid eye that can actually be found. I'm not saying I don't exist. That'd be ridiculous. I mean, all I need to do is go, ah, then I know I'm there. You know, just need to pinch myself. But in terms of this, there's something there, there's something here, some controller. And if I, if it were to stop there, actually I'd be okay. But because this is here, truly, there's something, something naturally here, something intrinsic right here. And you are over there kind of further away. So therefore, I exaggerate the importance of this here, and this is less important over there. So I exaggerate. I've added already something, and now I add more. You are truly over there. It's not just from my perspective. Oh, no, no, no. I'm actually, I'm the center, and you're secondary. It's truly like that. Nothing to do with my perspective. No, no, truly. And if you harm me, who is truly, who is inherently, who is independently precious, you are independently bad. <laughs> right? You, th that's my sense. And it goes further that you say something negative, but it's not just the words that are negative. You become negative. You become negative. Right? And then it's likewise with this person, on the other hand, that I'm attached. So if they give me happiness because they say I'm wonderful, then I'm not just attached to those words, but to the whole person. It's very funny how the attachment and the anger exaggerates. I'll tell you a funny story. How I became aware of that. How with the attachment, it grew so big, this person. When I was 16, I had a crush on someone at high school. This guy was just not interested in me. He didn't even see me. But I did see him. I had such a crush on him. And I was so attached more and more that even his backpack, he had like a little backpack. <laughs> oh, it was beautiful because it was his backpack. <laughs> right? My attachment was like radiating out. It was not just whatever, his face or the way he talked or the way he positioned himself. No, he went out to his backpack. And then he went to the U.S. for an exchange program. And when he got back, I'd forgotten, right? I thought, what did I see in him? Backpack? Person? What, what did I... You see, my exaggerated perception of that person, that my attachment had disappeared, and thereby my exaggerated perception of the person. So this is our difficulty. In terms of our perception, we perceive things. Yes, surely we do perceive them, but then we add a little bit to them. We make them just a little bit more concrete, just a little bit more solid, just a little bit more intrinsic like this. Like in and of themselves, they're like that. Totally nothing to do with my perception, no really like that. And then, in accordance with that, we judge good and bad. And following from that, if 
this precious eye is harmed, then that's really negative. If the same action is done to my neighbor, who I don't like, that's really good. <laughs> right? Okay. And so then, exaggerating, and an emotion arises, such as anger. Anger is this wishful, this, this emotional state where you just wish to harm the person, wish to be away from this person. It comes with the exaggeration. Yeah. So there are actually names for those stages. There is the basic misperception. Then there is this exaggerating attitude. can be described. Sometimes people call it inappropriate attitude. But since they're all inappropriate, might as well give it the name of its function. It is exaggerating. And then emotions arise, such as anger, attachment. Actually, today, someone asked me a very good question, because we, we deal with anger and attachment and ignorance a lot. Because I think that is very appropriate at the time of the Buddha, later on in India and in Tibet. But in the 21st century, we need to add one really, really bad emotion. Jealousy and envy. We're really suffering in the 21st century with the competitiveness. We need to include jealousy and envy. And in fact, someone asked me today, what is the difference between the two? Very important question. And when Rinpoche taught, I kept using the word jealousy. Because for envy, you can use jealousy, but for jealousy, you can't use envy, the way it's actually used. So let me just say a few words about this, that we're clear about the meaning, because they also have to be added. We're very familiar, usually, with attachment and anger, but less familiar with jealousy and envy. And those two are so painful. They're really painful, right? To use a joke from Rubina Curtin, no one, no one says, I had a great day yesterday, I was jealous all day long. <laughs> right? It's so true. It's not, attachment can give us a sense of, I was so attached the whole day, I got what I wanted. Okay, so there could be some, some sense of well-being. With anger, no, it's not well-being, but if we can punch them in the... Oh, I think there's someone trying to get in. Is that possible? Um, but if you can kind of try to punch them in the face, there's kind of like, ah, got it done. <laughs> <laughs> but with jealousy, it's painful. Envy is painful. So the difference between envy and jealousy is, envy is there are two people involved, myself and another person usually. And then this other person has something that I'm attached to. Therefore, I resent them for having it. So I have a resentment, a type of aversion towards the person who has it because of attachment to that which they have. So if they, my neighbor has a bigger car than me, right, or a bigger house that I envy them for, then I'm attached, I crave that house, I'm attached or I crave it, but I resent this person for having it. I should be the one having it, right? Similarly with position, in our job, someone gets the position I was, I was striving to get, I resent this person. Of course, it doesn't have to be resentment, but if it's real envy, like full-blown painful envy, then I resent that person, even if they're close to me, for getting what I want to get myself. Jealousy, in the strictest sense, there are three people involved. Jealousy usually involves another person. And there's the fear of losing that person. So when you're in a relationship, that if they talk to someone else, right, the third person, I'm afraid that this person I'm close to, so there's me, the person who's my partner or my friend or... I don't know, my parent, in the case of sibling jealousy, right? And then there is the, the, the person that they're with. Okay, so there's myself. So there's three people usually. And there's a fear of losing it. Resentment again towards the person who we feel this other person will maybe go off with. 
and uh, attachment towards the person who we are afraid of losing. So that's jealousy. But there are variations, and I think it's, it's just good to, what I think is important, is to have a sense of what they refer to, to identify them when they arise. Oh, oh, that was jealousy. Oh, that was envy. Oh, interesting. So first we learn about these different emotions to be able to recognize them. Okay? So that's why I just quickly wanted to say a few words about them. They're not that hard to understand. And you first describe them, and then you look at your own mind. It's getting warm. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Suffering of change. <laughs> Uh, okay, yes, that's what I'm saying. It's suffering of change. It's a very interesting observation in, in Singapore, the suffering of change. Outside, inside, outside. <laughs> anyway, so. So, therefore, with regard to these afflicti afflictive emotions, to recognize this is anger, I'm exaggerating the negativity, I feel anger, attachment, I'm exaggerating, but this is not what I'm going into today. I just thought to give you just a brief explanation on that. Of course, arrogance I haven't mentioned. But it's just, again, we take one aspect, we take one aspect which we blow out of proportions, a quality that we have, blow it out of proportion, and then feel very full about it. Right? Feel like we're better than others. So it's an exaggeration again. In all cases, it's an exaggeration. When we're jealous, we exaggerate the importance of that person. When we're envious, we exaggerate the object of attachment, the importance. So there's always an aspect of adding something, of exaggerating. But those being destructive emotions, of course, they also have positive counterparts. Where we don't exaggerate. Where we don't exaggerate, because we're not influenced by the misperception or influenced to a lesser degree. The more we're influenced by our misperception, the stronger the sense of I, the stronger these particular negative emotions. But in the case of positive emotions, of course they can function when there is misperception, but they can also function when we don't misperceive reality. When we see things for what they really are, then they can go really strong. Love can grow very strong. Compassion can grow very strong. Nothing in the way. We cannot fully have love and fully have compassion if the I comes in all the time. But of course, when I say love and compassion, what does that mean? Again, we're taking words from everyday language and then use them in a slightly different way. So those of you who are familiar with this, okay, you don't need to hear that explanation, but maybe just to find to you love in the Buddhist way. Love is supposed to be unconditional. Okay, unconditional. Plus is actually the wish for someone to be happy. The wish for someone to be happy, that is defined as love. Um, a caring attitude that wishes for someone to be happy. Right? So our relationships with other people are a mixture. Sometimes I want this person to be happy. I want them sincerely to be happy. Sometimes I want him or her to make me happy. So that is when attachment comes in. Okay? So if they want to go out and do something, and I want, I'm supportive of them. Oh, how wonderful. They want to go out and maybe take an extra class or training program, and we support them. We want them to be happy and we're supportive. But that may mean they have to go abroad and leave us. And so my own interest comes in. Mm, yes, I want him or her to be happy, but ooh, 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 can't let go. Can't go. Sorry, can do it in Singapore. Don't go to France to go there, right? 
And possibly jealousy comes in. A lot of beautiful French women or French men. No, 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 no. <laughs> right? Okay. So that's the problem. So it's this, this mixture with our children too. Yes, I want them to be happy. But they should do such and such because, you know, my neighbor wants to know that she's got a degree, a high degree. You know, I mean, I've watched my mom often enough with a neighbor. In her case, with me, she had a hard time finding something to show up with because I'm just <laughs> a total case of being a loser in my own country. <laughs> oh, my daughter is a Buddhist now. Ooh. Now she keeps saying about the Geshe, and they're like, what's that? <laughs> so my mom has her own version of what a Geshe means. <laughs> so she can show up with a neighbor. But, you know, so this is like it's our mixture. It's a mixture between attachment and love, right? It's a mixture of those two. So, so love is the wish really for someone to be happy, and it's a motivating force. Sometimes people say, well, Buddhism is all about love, but they don't act on it. They just sit on their cushion, love, love, love. <laughs> well, if that's true, then that's a problem. It's just a motivating force that, of course, should then inform our actions, that is, control our actions of body, speech, and mind. It's just a motivating force. And then we talk about compassion versus love. We should actually talk more about love. Why we talk about compassion all the time? Right? Wouldn't it be much easier to say love? But there's a very good reason for why we use compassion more versus love. Does anyone know the reason for that? That's it. Because although we want others to be happy, what stops others from being happy is suffering. So we need to remove that to bring that happiness forth. Right? It's like a doctor wishes for his patients to be healthy, but to bring this about, he first wishes for them to get better, to be free from disease. So that's the job of the doctor. Bring forth the state of freedom from the disease. Okay? So, therefore, there's more emphasis on compassion. As I just said, it's a caring attitude. Just as before with the caring attitude. A caring attitude or an attitude of closeness towards someone. And the wish for that person to be free from suffering, just in general, whatever that type of suffering refers to. Now, this is greatly misunderstood, many t a lot in the West, definitely in the West. So, being compassionate does not mean you get pulled down by the suffering of all sentient beings. People have this sense, oh, if I start generating compassion, I need to start by recognizing the suffering. And if I recognize the suffering, oh my God, I got enough depressing situations that I'm faced with in terms of my own suffering. And then if I add just the Singaporean suffering, how many, five million, six million portions of suffering? Oh my God, that is just I'm going to be so depressed. <laughs> Six million suffering on, on top of me. So people feel, first of all, reflecting on all that suffering will lead to depression. Okay? That's one attitude. And then also they feel that an expression of compassion is if you start crying and, oh, these sentient beings, oh, right? That, none of those are compassion. It shouldn't, I mean, just, just breaking out in tears doesn't necessarily mean, I mean, as one of my great teachers, Geshe Tutum Pesan, would say, that's timidness, right? He has a very strong sense. He says compassion is strong. Compassionate is courage. It leads to courage. Courage. It's like you see the suffering of sentient beings and you go, that's not okay. I need to do something. This is not all right. I personally need to do something. So it's not about feeling depressed. It's about seeing things for what they are and try or have the determination to make a change. Because, of course, 
Understanding suffering goes along with an understanding there are causes and conditions that brought this forth. And the good news is if there are causes and conditions, they can be removed. Just as if a symptom has a cause, a cause for a sickness, you can remove the cause. So therefore, what is there to be depressed about? To recognize it and see I'm needed. In my situation right now, I have found a method that maybe is appropriate for that person, so I need to do something. So it gives you courage, it gives you strength. So sometimes people argue also with like the afflictive emotions, and especially in the West. I'm not sure about Israel, uh, but Singapore. I'm sh I know about Israel. I go frequently, I go to Israel, where they say anger is good, gives you strength, gives you strength, you know, it's there. And then they, they always cite the, the, the cave beings. They could, they could defend their whole family when, when, when someone from a different tribe would come. And you'd be so strong, you could fight them off. Okay. So, and then compassion, you just become like, a, you become like a doormat, a punching bag. Oh, beat me up, you're <laughs> suffering. Right? But that's a total misunderstanding of both anger and compassion. Where in, 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 some, in the West, at least, anger is associated with strength. Compassion is associated with meekness. But as Geshe Tutan Pesang, I, I just quoted him, has said, no, it means courage. It means strength. The more compassionate you are, the more determined you are. Anger? Try to be angry for five hours. You are exhausted. <laughs> right? You're exhausted. I mean, it takes out all your energy. It gives you that rush, maybe, but it, it saps all your energy. And that whole thing about the cave people, very dangerous. A cave person would always take the elevator, not the steps. Because you had to run all day long, so in order to preserve energy, anything to make it more comfortable, that doesn't mean it applies to the 21st century, right? So exercising, we have a, we have a difficulty with like, we have a bit of a hard time starting exercising because we have a sense I have to preserve my energy, I guess, to some degree. That's why it's so hard to do. But that's not a good reason in the 21st century, even if cavemen did that to preserve their energy. This is a big reason in the West. Anything the caveman does is good. So <laughs> preserving your energy and eating sweet things is also something that cavemen would do because they didn't get much sweet. So any fruit with vitamins, so they would eat that. So therefore, the same reasoning, anger is good for you because the cave... No, it doesn't work. In fact, compassion gives you much more strength. Look at His Holiness the Dalai Lama. I mean, the people who work for His Holiness, they work in shifts. <laughs> they do. I mean, you can't keep up with His Holiness. An ordinary person can't keep up because the strength of His love and compassion... I mean, it's hard to believe his homeless is 83 years old. The way he's like teaching for hours. It's the power of love and compassion. And here it's unimpeded. It's not constricted by the self-grasping that we are constricted by. Right? So that's what we actually aim for. Love, compassion. Why? Because what does his homeless the Dalai Lama say? If you want others to be happy, be compassionate. If you want yourself to be happy, be compassionate. So there are certain emotional states that give us a lot of calm and a lot of happiness. And we are, as human beings, we have this emotional side and we have a rational side. But right now, instead of compassion and love, um, rejoicing, rejoicing in the success of other people, being happy for them when they do well. We have anger, we have attachment, we have jealousy, envy, and so forth. And we suffer. We suffer so much. And so I said initially, if a Buddha goes into a Gucci store or a toilet that has not been cleaned, nirvana. <laughs> if we go there, 
samsara. Not because of the toilet, not because of the Gucci store or what have you, because of the mind being different. So actually, that's such incredible news, such good news, because the one thing we can change is our own mind. The one thing we can change. I cannot change you. I can ask you to change and I hope you would. I don't even know how to tell you what is best for you to change. But my own mind is the one thing I can change. That is the one thing I can change. And there are methods to doing so. And the method is dependent arising. The method is dependent arising so that we are able to generate true compassion, true love, and so forth. Does that make sense? Okay. All right. Now, I like to bring in science a little bit. Because it's the 21st century, and the new religious philosophy, I say, in the West at least, is science. Right? The Buddha said so, <laughs> blind belief. A guy with a fancy degree from Harvard, he said so, must be true. That's not <laughs> blind faith, right? That's not blind faith. He's got a Harvard degree. He's got enlightenment. Ugh, don't know, but he's got a Harvard degree, right? <laughs> I love that when people say, oh, they all have blind faith. They say the Buddha said so and they believe it. I agree. I agree. That's blind faith. But if the same person then says, yeah, but Stephen Hawkins said so, it's true. I'm going, hmm, how is one blind faith, but the other one isn't? Right? I mean, we have a lot of blind faith. We have a lot of blind So we believe in what scientists tell us, but what a religious person tells us, well, we don't believe. So I think it's good not to believe what a religious person tells us, but also not have blind faith in someone with a fancy degree. Because today they tell us coffee is good for us and tomorrow it's bad and then the day after it's good for us again. I mean, who doesn't get confused? Right? I mean, science doesn't have all the answers. So scientists are the first ones to admit, don't believe everything we're saying. But we still do. And there's a good reason for it. Of course, they have come to know a lot of things. So it's good to use scientific methods. It's important. And the beauty is that Buddhism and science have come very close. They have become very close. Not just because they get together with His Holiness the Dalai Lama. I'm not talking about that. I mean, that part too. But on top of it, also, the ideas have become very close now. So you remember I talked about the importance of the mind. It's really interesting for me. Some time ago, I read a book about the history of science. About 400 years ago, scientists started to develop, to, to come into existence, scientific methods came into existence. And it's really interesting how they started off with this idea, let's find an objective reality. Right? Kind of knowing, okay, my view is subjective, another person's view is subjective, but leave out the mind, because the mind is too subjective. Let's ignore the mind. So let's find the God view. So they kind of had God still in the picture, being Christian-based, Judo-Christian kind of, uh, or Islamic and Judo-Christian kind of idea. So there was this idea of a God view, a sub objective reality. And over the centuries, because things could be measured, they could be weighed, y th there was this illusion you have an objective world that we're just discovering. We're just stepping into this world and see them for what it is. That's how it feels anyway. And the scientists had that idea initially. Until slowly they realized, well, who's measuring? The mind. Who's weighing? I mean, who's reading the scale? Okay, it's the, 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 the scale, but who's reading the scale? Who is giving the different measurements? Who's deciding this is a kilo, this is a hundred gram? Who's doing it? It's humans. It's us. So it's totally subjective. So what is that world view? And they slowly moved away and they, they came to understand we can't leave out the mind. If we leave out the mind, and try to understand a reality, who has access to that? 
And so there are mathematicians slash philosophers such as Peter Russell, a contemporary uh, philosopher and, and scientist, who's talked about this a lot. He's criticized this. He's saying the mind is so important. The one thing we really know is there is our own mind. You could all be zombies. I know my own mind is there. I don't know you have a mind. For all I know, you could all be zombies or robots or something. I have no way of knowing you have a mind. I know my own. So I know I'm experiencing things. I don't even know whether that which I experience exists. These objects that appear to me, I don't know. So this is actually a big revolutionary way of thinking. So science now slowly moves more, some at least does, understanding you cannot leave out the mind. I'm not saying there's nothing out there. I'm just saying the one thing that we really know we have is mind, experiencer. But that's the thing we don't know. We know colors, we know shapes, we know this is a classical song and this is a rock song, and, but this is attachment, this is anger, very difficult initially. To recognize our own mind because we're not used to looking at it. We're used to looking outwards. Therefore, in Buddhism, this idea of the mind comes in. Recognizing this mind, this consciousness. And using scientific methods of analysis and so forth to understand the mind better. And that takes me to the pendant arising. Okay? So we use our mind. It's all connected to the mind, but we can still talk of dependent arising as a separate idea, first of all, and then bring it close to the mind and make sense of compassion and love in that context. So I apologize for that huge introduction, but just to put it into place, the way I've learned about it, the way it makes sense to me. And I hope I didn't lose you with like difficult terminology. I've tried not to use any of those technical terms, um, other than mind maybe, but we all know that word, consciousness, awareness. And now, dependent arising. Okay, dependent arising, here already, what a weird word, <laughs> right? It's a translation from the Sanskrit as well as the Tibetan. So I don't even dare to say the Sanskrit because my pronunciation is so appalling. Praticya Samuchaya. <laughs> but the Tibetan I'm more confident with. Denjin Dewa Jungwa or Denjung. Okay? All right. So basically, the, the translation is dependent arising. We all know the word dependent. Everyone feels comfortable with the word dependent. But the arising, come on, are you kidding me? Why, just not, why don't you just say dependently existent? I've had that question. Why not just say it what it is? Depend it exists dependently. Something exists dependently. That's actually a good point. And there is, there is uh, a word in Tibetan, Dainetruba, which kind of means um, dependently established or dependently existent. So you have that word too. That word exists. So that's a little easier. Something exists in dependence on something other than itself. That's really what it means. So dependent means, and we all know what dependence means to some degree, that this book exists in dependence on something other than itself. Right? It depends on, it depends on itself too, but it also depends on many other things. Okay, so it exists in dependence on other things. So now why say arising? Why make it dependently arisen? It has arisen. Arisen, that's like a weird word. <laughs> the other day was so nice. <laughs> it's so easy to misunderstood. Remember she said, you rise as a Buddha figure. And people got up. <laughs> <laughs> so the word has so many connotations. Arise. <laughs> Please all rise, <laughs> right? So it's, it's a difficult world. We're again using a word. We're using a word 
that in everyday life means something. The sun rises, right? This arose to my own mind, like something appearing. Okay? But actually here the word arisen mean, means come into existence. Something has come into existence in dependence on other things. So not only does it exist now, in dependence on other things, but also when it arose, it did so in dependence on other things. So it also stresses the fact that there was a time it wasn't there and it came into existence in dependence on many factors. And even now that it exists, that it exists, it exists in dependence on many factors. Okay? So therefore, dependent arisen means really it came into existence. It's not coming into existence because it has already come. So you use the past. It has come into existence. So it has come, it has arisen. It's there already, independence on other things. And then you want to use an even weirder word that's harder to spell. Dependent origination. That's my least favorite translation, but okay. It originated independence. So it's, it, it arose, that is, it came into existence, independence on causes. That's what, it, that's what it means. Right? So after all, being in Singapore, I could just call it DA. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk about BP. And today's topic is... So Buddhist philosophy, <laughs> let's talk about BP <laughs> by talking about DA <laughs> in the TBC. <laughs> okay, so anyway, talking about now dependent arising or dependent existence. Okay. Now, as you're probably all aware, or many of you are aware, when we talk of dependent arising, there's said to be three types of dependent arising. Three types. So, being very Tibetan Buddhist, I like to categorize things. Or, to make it easier, basically, in the texts from the Nalanda tradition, of course, coming from the Nalanda tradition, things are categorized actually just to understand them better. And there's one way of categorizing them in this particular way, categorizing them into three, where those three are mentioned or are uh, categorized in dependence on that, and on that which the phenomenon is dependent on. So the dependee, right? You have that which is dependent and that which it is dependent on. Okay? So let's say a table. Classic example. Because... Seems in every Dharma talk there's always a table. <laughs> okay? Chariot is the classic, but don't see those around much. So, <laughs> not a chariot, it's a table. So, this table is dependent by way of three, in three ways. In three ways. Because it is dependent on three different things. It is dependent on certain causes and conditions. Just an easier way of saying it, it's dependent on certain causes. Right? Conditions seems like, why make it more difficult? Why do you add the word condition? You know, it's like in the back of your mind, why add that word? Just say causes. <laughs> but there's a reason for that. So causes, dependence on causes, basically, just to keep it simple. All right. So this table must have had certain causes, of course, and they're straightforward, a piece of wood, uh, a carpenter, glue, nails, paint, okay. Then, dependence on, what's the second type of dependence? Parts. Parts. It's dependent on parts. Now, that's a little bit more difficult because parts in English means something specific, but the word in, in this context can be used in a wider sense. So usually we think of parts as spatial parts, right? Parts in space. That's okay. That's totally right. So the surface of the table, the legs of the table, 
the glue of the table, the nails of the table, the pain of the table, table, right? Those are all parts which occupy space. Pretty straightforward. Okay. All right. But then it has other parts. It has other parts. What are the other parts? That we wouldn't usually call parts. But it's just we use this word in a in a more in a wider sense. It's been accepted that way. So let's just let go of our usual sense of parts, not just physical parts that occupy space, but look at it in a slightly different way, as like having something without which, having something that is not the table, but without which it couldn't be a table. Can you think of something? Anything? Anything? Pardon? Oh, those are st spatial parts, left part and right part. So those will still occupy space, right? So very good. So I'm saying left part and right part. Yes, those are also different from the surface and the t and the legs. But can you think of something that you don't associate with seeing it, like with your eye consciousness? But they're still. Or you, it's a little bit more abstract. It's a little bit more abstract. I mean, one, one way in which you can think of the parts of the table, you can actually see it, but it's more abstract. And another way, you can't even see it. Okay, atoms and particles, very good. So those are still spatial parts, okay? But still very good because you cannot see them. Very good. Pardon? The sub-moments. The sub-moments, the table within an hour, you can now divide it into first minute of the table, second minute. We don't talk like that, right? Oh, that first minute of the table was so pretty. The second one was just not that nice. We don't talk like that. But in actuality, it is a continuum in time. It exists during a certain time, I hope, a long time. Okay, let's say a few years, until the center decides, nope. Legs are broken off, paint is gone, no chewing gum stuck underneath. That's very beautiful in, in Singapore. <laughs> in the West, you always have to be careful. You may you know, find some chewing gum stuck underneath the table. Okay, so one day they decide to check it off, and then that continuum as that table has gone out of existence. But from the moment it was made until the moment it was disassembled, let's say, we called it a table and it existed during the time. That's a part of it. So the whole table, the whole continuum consists of moments in time. Very good. What else? Another part you could think of. It's not, in English you use a different word usually. You would use a different word. Yes, 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 yes. Characteristics such as color and shape. Size, the impermanence of this table, the characteristic of changing. It changes. Someone mentioned the atoms and the particles of this table. Since we all know to some degree that atoms or that which, that which makes up the atom is made of, what is it, protons, neurons, right, electrons, and that they're in constant movement, Therefore, we can tell, since the atoms are changing, therefore, that which makes the table, th those little things, those building blocks of the table, since they change, we can say the table changes. So, the table is impermanent. Those are all parts of the table. If any of those were missing, you couldn't have this table. Not that difficult, is it? Right? It's not really that difficult. So here we're just looking at a, at a course level. I'm not saying dependent arising is easy. It is, can, you can go to a level where it's really difficult, very difficult to understand. But just, let's just start with the easier part. First of all, this table had causes, okay, just to repeat it, causes and conditions that created this table, which must have preceded the table. So first there was a time when the table was not here yet, but the causes and conditions came together, and then you had the table. So the causes and conditions, they have passed, so the table depended on those 
moments or that time before it came into existence. Okay, and now it is here and it exists also on things other than itself, which are the parts, the characteristics, the moments in time. Great. But what else does it depend on? Okay, labeling. But let's first be a little bit, let's take a simpler level. It depends on mind. It depends on consciousness. Are you kidding me? <laughs> depends on consciousness? Okay, here modern science is actually helping us to understand that. Thanks God for, no, thanks Buddha for. <laughs> 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 so, lucky that we have modern science because from a Buddhist point of view, the third level of dependence is, and I'm here taking a slight, slightly uh, coarser level, which the labeling we get into, but we have time, a few more days. So one coarser level is the fact that you need consciousness to perceive this table. Now, how? How does modern science help us? How does modern science establish that this table needs consciousness to exist. What do you think? Pardon? It's an object, okay. But it's perceived. But why do we need a consciousness to perceive this table? Can you tell me something about the table? Yes, yes, you can try. try. Yeah. Okay, so Nam is saying if no one is looking at the table, how can you prove it's a table? But how does modern science come in here? So if you, by not observing, you uh -huh. know the observed observe object which exists. So the modern science will use the tools and means to observe it so that you can take measurement. Okay. So measurement comes from observation. Okay. Without observation, there's no measurement. Okay, so okay. Measurements, okay. Does everyone hear what Sonam said? Okay, you need to be able to say it's an object and to measure it and to determine. But he's already, okay, determine that. You need, therefore, a mind to do so. But he's already taking it to a subtler level. He's totally right. But take something else. Tell me something about what you see here. What do you see here? What did you say? Carving. You, s do you see a color? Yes, a color? Color. Very good. What color is it? I don't see it from my side. Uh, oh, it's reddish. It's okay, red. it's red. Green. Does red, from a scientific point of view, exist here? Or what is color? What is color? It's a light frequency, yeah. right? What do you know about color? You've, you've probably all learned this in biology, okay? How do we perceive color? It's a light frequency. <laughs> Each color, what we call a color, has a light frequency. Some are longer, some are shorter. Black is, is considered to, to absorb all the light, whereas white, uh, I think it has the longest frequency or something. I don't remember all the details now. But there's a whole spectrum of colors, and they have certain length of frequency. So what we see as red does not exist as red. It is just a light frequency. And so it is because of the coming together of these light frequencies and our retina, the optical nerve, and our visual cortex that we perceive red. So from a scientific point of view, you can Google it. Ho homework. <laughs> Why? How do we see colors? Okay, it's very complicated. I usually go... How do we see colors for dummies? <laughs> <laughs> if I need anything about science. So anyway, you can get very beautiful explanations. And what is very beautiful in there, you find that we have cones in our eyes and rots and all these things where you have different numbers of cones for different people. So we see colors differently. So there's actually, there has been proof that what I perceive red, someone else may perceive as purple, but we both call it red. 
we don't even see the same color. So we see within a similar spectrum, but it's not the same. There's been proof that language determines how much color you see. Whoa, we're going already into areas that actually come after a few days. I haven't gone into this, but just as a preparation. I tell you, science and Buddhism is coming closer. So, but just go back to the basic color. If this is red, we call this red, but the color red that we see is not found on the object. Okay? Therefore, you do not have a red table that exists independent of consciousness. Now, if you don't have a red table, you don't have the color. So the color of this table doesn't exist out there, independent of our mind. And since you can't have a shape without color, also the shape cannot exist out there without a mind. And since if you say table minus shape minus color, you're pretty much not left with the table. From a scientific point of view, we can determine that this table to be perceived depends on the mind. Is there something other than that? I don't know. But what I perceive, what I perceive, what you perceive, you perceive it, yes, we all perceive it, we'd all agree on it being red. But first of all, you all perceive something different from the point of view of where you sit. Okay? You have a slightly different perspective. Distance, this side of the room, that side of the room, upstairs, looking through it. You don't, those upstairs, I'm sorry, you don't even see the table. You only see a reflection of the table. Do I hear any laughter? No. <laughs> so anyway, the point is that you all see something different. You all see something separate. And therefore, there's an individual perception of this table. Right? An individual, each personal perception. Now the question is, does this table exist the way you perceive it? Is there something other than this table or not? But what is important is you need the mind to see it. So that's the third type of dependent rising. Take sound. Sound. It's, it's pressure waves. It is actually just pressure waves with particles being pushed in the sky, uh, sorry, in the space between us. So our vocal cord, it vibrates, right? It creates pressure waves with a certain vibrance, I guess. And then that, that vibration enters our eardrum. There's another object that vibrates, there are little hairs on them. And then some electrical, I don't know, current, whatever is, is moved to the brain and we perceive sound. There is no such sound out there. So modern science has done us a great, in terms of dependent arising, third type of dependent arising, has done us a great service in establishing this Buddhist principle. Okay? But it doesn't feel that way. That's the problem. Science does not tell us, meditate on it. Feel it. So it's kind of like intellectually up there, but deep within, oh, I'm so attached to that blue. Oh, that blue over there, I want to get it. Right? So we're still deceived by it, but at least science has helped us to understand that you need consciousness. And Buddhism takes it even further. Okay, so these are just the three types. And now I want to see whether we can already make a connection between the little bit, and I'll go deeper into dependent horizon. Just, this is just the surface. But how we can already see that an understanding of dependent arising can help us to generate more compassion. How there's really a relationship. Okay. It has to be practical. It has to be practical such that we take something with us and tomorrow in the real world, <laughs> when in the real world with so many great teachers of patience all around us, we can actually maybe po possibly learn to apply it. So what can, who can come up with an example where understanding causes and conditions of something help to make our heart softer, help us to be more compassionate? What do you think?
You all know, you've all gone through it, I'm pretty sure. But just if I put you on the spot like that, it may not be so spontaneous, very natural. I give you an example of something I myself I had an experience of that one day. I listened to a program. I listened to a program, and it was about a serial killer. He had killed all these women. Terrible. He had created so much suffering. And I could feel in my mind, oh, what an evil person, right? I, I, I caught myself thinking, oh, I'm glad they don't have the death penalty in that state. It shouldn't be over for him right away. He should suffer in a prison, and right? And just that aversion towards this person. So there was like a sense, oh, that's pure evil. Okay? Just hearing what he had done to these horrible, these horrible things he had done, the suffering he created for these young girls, and they're trying to get the same in your mind coming, so you hear me talk about him. <laughs> I mean, these young, beautiful girls had nothing done. Little girls, little boys, it was terrible. And then they talked about the causes and conditions that made him the person he was. Wow. And then I realized a victim, a perpetrator, is also a victim. Which doesn't mean he should not be punished. Please don't get me wrong. But that feeling of hatred, that feeling of, ooh, suddenly my heart softened. So hearing, oh my God, he was born into a family, both parents, heroin users, alcoholics, heroin users. He was raped by his, his uncle. He was mistreated by his, he was beaten up by his grandfather. His parents left him without any food. I mean, he could only talk at the age of five or six because his parents never really taught him to, 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 uh, speak properly. So his language was very, he couldn't really go to school. No one cared for him. He, I mean, it was just terrible. It was so heartbreaking. And then I thought, well, I had this thought, if I were him, would I, do I know for certain I would not act like that? Can I be, so how, I felt like I'm so judgmental saying, oh, this person, I'm so, I know what's right and this is wrong and this person is done. But with causes and conditions, I could feel understanding what gave rise to that person. And please don't get me wrong, compassion doesn't mean you do not punish them for his benefit and for the benefit of others. He needs to be locked away, he needs to be left safe, and possibly, you know, don't give him a spa as, as a bathroom or what have you. It's still punishment is necessary, but this feeling of hatred, that feeling of, of that, is softened by understanding the causes and conditions. And if you take another example, you're in the traffic jam, there's this obnoxious person, not looking right or left and just going right in there, and you feel like, that jerk, and you honk your horn, it's like, what a, I don't know what this Singaporean expression would be, <laughs> maybe some AD, ADR or something, <laughs> anyway, you're really annoyed, and then you hear this guy, his wife has just left him this morning, or has found out she has cancer, or, you know, he's been kicked, and you go, oh gosh, just go ahead, if it makes you feel better, just do it again, <laughs> right, your heart softens, so just understanding the causes and conditions of how phenomena come into existence can truly soften your hearts. And that's just, the that's just the most superficial level. Trust me, there's so much more to causes and conditions, <laughs> really making it complicated. But the, although it's complicated, I have one confidence. I have the confidence to teach this. Because if someone like me can understand it, anyone can understand it. <laughs> Seriously, that gives me a lot of confidence. If someone like me, from some country where they don't even know how to spell Buddhism correctly, can <laughs> understand it, I, I, I'm very confident anyone can. It just takes time. It just takes time. But anyway, that course level for tonight, you've had a long day, you've had lots of real people probably, you know, traffic and so forth. But what I would like you to do until tomorrow, and I take some questions. Um, I'd like to teach until nine and then take questions. If you feel you had a long day, I should stop at nine, but I'm only here for a short time. So I thought I'd take your questions and if anyone needs to leave, it's not disrespectful if you get up and leave. I always tell people, please leave if you like to, uh, or if you need to, of course, and then we continue a little longer. But I'd like to also give you a homework. If you're lucky enough to be really annoyed tomorrow, 
someone annoys you, you know, someone is hard to generate compassion for, try to see whether you can feel some causes and conditions come up with this idea, someone you find very difficult to have compassion for. And just imagine what could have been responsible. We don't know 100%, but usually it's pretty much similar, right? Angry people are oftentimes coming from parents who have not been able to control them or they've not really received, I don't know, much attention, whatever it is. I mean, modern psychology has a huge, you know, a huge, I mean, pages and pages of explanations for that. And even if we don't get 100% right, of course, we can also talk about karma. Bring that into the picture. Out of misperceptions, they acted in a certain way and not knowing, of course. Not knowing. We, do so, we make so many mistakes in our own life that lead us to being angry and so forth. So, everyone is just like us. To, to consider just the causes and conditions and see whether the sincere wish may that person be free from their suffering, from their misperceptions, from their afflictions, and may they find true love and true happiness. Maybe that works, but just right, just try it. Don't try it with the person it's hardest with. Right? And maybe there's one person really difficult. Okay, for now, not this person. Another one. Okay? So you start slowly. Okay? And in that way practice. Okay? That's like your homework for tomorrow, if you like. Okay. Now we have half an hour, I mean, if I take half an hour more, uh, take your questions. I'm a little bit, I have a little bit more than half an hour, but anyway, start taking your questions. If you have any questions, you're welcome to ask about this. If it's under other questions and I find it important in this context, I'll answer it. Otherwise, I will ask you to wait and maybe see whether we can make some other time for that. Okay, so please, any questions? Maybe somewhere upstairs. Any questions from upstairs? Any questions? <laughs> no <Cecilia>? question? <laughs> <laughs> Any questions from upstairs? <laughs> Someone has to be first. Yes, you're first. Okay. That's one. That's one. Oh, there's one. Okay, sorry. Uh, hi, Gishima. Okay, so um, I know it's not the first day, but maybe is is there any seminal books that you can recommend on the dependent origination? Oh, okay. In English, right? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> In fact, I know a German book on it, but it hasn't. I don't know why it's not translated into English. Um, is there a book on that? Does anyone else know? Is there a book in English on dependent arising specifically on that? I'm afraid I'm not aware. I mean, it's mentioned in many books. It is mentioned again and again. So there is this book inside, I think, by Geshe, by Geshe Chamba Tekcho. What is the book called? That's right, insight into emptiness. So any book on emptiness always mentions also dependent arising. Um, so basically, so insight into emptiness by Geshe Chamba Techo. Um, that's the one I can think of right now. But let me do some research. Let me look tonight and then let you know, hopefully tomorrow. And all of you could... Maybe also do well. No, no, you're busy enough with, with your homework. <laughs> so let's leave it for that. Okay. So, but hopefully that helps a little bit. Thank you, Gishima. Okay, welcome. Yes, you have a question. Can we pass the microphone on? To you? Uh, just one more. Yes, please. Just one more. Sure, sure. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. 
Hello, I'm Hello. upstairs. Yeah, hi. <laughs> um, so I have a question about the um, dependencies. Okay. So you know how you're talking about red as a color is not really red. It's just red to my eye or your eye because right. of light frequencies. I so yeah. if, if uh, you know, this is the classic question that if a tree falls mm -hmm. in a forest... <laughs> but nobody saw it, mm -hmm. did does it, it fall? And does, does the Buddhist believe it didn't fall if nobody saw it? Okay. Or, or is it the other way around? <laughs> no, good question. This, this question always comes up yeah, sorry. sooner or later. No, good, very good. I'm glad you bring it up. So, there's this classical philosophical um, um, kind of scenario. If a tree falls in a forest and no one is there to see it, does it make a sound when it falls over? Right? That's the question. What would be the Buddhist answer? What tree? <laughs> so, I mean, I've thought about this. Basically, only from the explanation that I've been given so far, that I've been giving so far. So, from the point of view, just colors and shapes dependent on the eye consciousness. Here, of course, the brain also plays a part in it, the retina and so forth, but the experience of a brown green tree, that is experienced by what we call consciousness. Now, unless such a consciousness were there, and I'm talking about no one there, I'm not just saying no humans, I'm saying no insects, no living being with a consciousness. Let's just assume that scenario, hard to believe to have a forest without insects, but just hypothetically. So in that case, with regard to this particular tree, well, a tree is that which is color and shape. But if that color and shape needs to be perceived by an eye consciousness, how can you then have a tree? So the only question you're left with, is there anything? Well, that is to be seen the next, in, the, in the coming days. But um, I hope at least I have giving you some sense from a Buddhist point of view, a tree, what do we call a tree? It is defined by that which has, well, certain characteristics and those definitely are associated with a certain color and shape. And since that is dependent on uh, an eye consciousness, so the tree as we know it cannot exist in that forest. And so therefore that tree cannot fall over and certainly cannot make the sound of a tree since sound again depends on an ear consciousness and there's no such a tree as we describe it in the first place. Okay, I hope that's, uh, that's the question. Yeah. All right. <gasps> okay, this is my old mistake, but I, I'm so glad I have Sona. He always slows me down. So do you need a little bit more time to translate? Okay, 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 okay. <laughs> Okay, sorry. I just say that last part again. So basically, a tree as we know it has a certain shape and color, which, as we have found to be the case, is perceived by an eye consciousness. Therefore, if you don't have an eye consciousness to perceive that shape and color, that particular tree doesn't exist. Therefore, it doesn't fall down and it doesn't make a sound. <laughs> okay, please, your question. Would it be too early to ask you something about depression? No, okay. depression is, yeah, definitely. Okay, okay I'll, I'm not sure I can go into it, but it depends on your question. Okay, yeah. mm -hmm. there's been a spate of suicide of famous people, mm. and then I read that there are certain things that we shouldn't say to depressed and suicidal people, such as... Uh, don't think like that. Remain positive. Snap out of it. Uh, why do you need to be so depressed? It's all in your head. Look at you. You're so lucky. There are other people suffering. But this is contrary to what I re read of my favorite teachers, like Lama Yeshi. She's always saying we are all mentally ill. <laughs> or Robina. She's always mm -hmm. saying we all have bipolar one uh, to some degree or the other. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. what is the Buddhist approach to treating clinical depression as 
diagnosed by, by Western psychologists. Mm -hmm. Wow, very important question, but also very difficult. Very difficult. Now, I can understand why they say, just step out of what you shouldn't say just step out of it think positively i mean if i'm terribly depressed and someone comes along and tells me i'll oh, just think positively it's like i have cancer and someone tells me just get over it it's just a few cells i mean the thing is it's so much more difficult than that and if we want to help someone by just using those phrases, that's kind of like almost making fun of the seriousness of that, of that condition. Because there are many causes and conditions that brought this forth. So one sentence will not undo those causes and conditions. But there's two ways of dealing with depression. One, if you have it yourself, and one when another person has it. It's always easier, right? In the sense like, if I have depression now, and if I have some understanding of the Dharma, I could look for the causes. I could, you know, check and go. I mean, I personally, I'm not free from feeling depressed, feeling unhappy. You know, there are happier times and there are less happy times. But I've learned to analyze what is the actual, what gave rise to it, and so forth. But this is not your question. Your question is really with regard to others. Yeah, so I know. So, therefore, therefore, I think what I personally would do is just listen. Just listen. Because a lot of it is so deeply buried in people, and oftentimes they have no outlet. And sometimes just putting it into words makes it less scary. There are these emotions deep within us. There are these scary, there's fear, and then there's fear of the fear. And then we can't do this and we can't do that. And then just allowing someone to talk about it, to just give them the time. Okay, just tell me what is exactly going on. Just, you know, just allow them if they're so ready to do so. But very, it's very, very difficult. It's a very difficult, and I cannot really provide you, but I, my first instinct would be just be there for them. Really show them that you deeply care. So again, why it's so important to have love and compassion? Because if we really care for this person, Rinpoche, it, that, oh, it, was, it really warmed my heart every time. I could watch him. When someone was, it brings tears to my eyes, actually, when I just think of it, he was so kind. I always watched him very carefully. And he always picked the person who he felt maybe was having more problems or was more depressed. <gasps> His compassion was so strong, right? It's like when he felt this person had some issues, he held their hand or someone said something about their problems and he was showered with gifts. It was like he was so compassionate. And it was so heartwarming because you could tell he just wanted to help this person. So it was so wonderful for these people to just be loved in that moment, to receive that love. Or with His Holiness the Dalai Lama, it's like unspeakable. It's unspeakable. With His Holiness on top of that, and I'm just giving the example of the Lamas, but we have all this potential. I once heard of this lady who came to the teachings, who came for the teachings for the first time. And no one knew anything about her except this one person who happened to stand next to me. And she said, oh, this woman over there, you know, she comes from the same area I come from. And her son was killed in an accident just recently. And she suffers so much. And she said, don't tell anyone because she doesn't want people to know. Gosh, when I talk about it, I get teary-eyed. His holiness walked past her. And I knew about it. And this lady did. And the love his holiness gave to this woman. How could he have known? I mean, I don't know. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> now you make me laugh, now it's gone. <laughs> but anyway, so the love he gave to her, you know, the understanding. 
And afterwards, before she just she just looked, you know, definitely not joyful. But afterwards, she was like. And that was so important. It was so important. I was like, wow, this was so amazing. So really, love and compassion can go so far if we really feel it. yeah. And just really make another person feel, I care. And if you want to be silent, let's be silent. If you want to talk, let's talk. Let's just sit here together. <coughs> that would be, I think, just to show this. And sometimes we can help and sometimes we can't. I mean, even this wholeness, the Dalai Lama, I'm sure people have killed themselves, although his wholeness has given everything. And still, sometimes it just, there's not much we can do. And again, we have given our best, but even the Buddha sometimes can't change things. But of course, this person will continue on and will eventually also find happiness. To also keep that in mind, to not be pulled down by it. And then when you mentioned like famous people killing themselves, that is such a terrible case of attachment to a name, to, to a certain position, if that is the cause of it. I don't know whether that's the cause. It could be, right? It could be in some cases we assume that someone who was very famous first and then suddenly they're no longer asked for, their beauty starts disappearing, and so they become unhappy and they kill themselves. Wow, that is just terrible. And it shows us again that these things are so transient. They just cannot give us real happiness. And if you just rely on them, you'll never find happiness. And again, such a good reason to have compassion, but also to learn from it, to find happiness somewhere else. So we have the strength to help other people and say, look, from my own experience, Beauty, it doesn't mean anything. It makes the anti-wrinkle companies very rich, but in the end, you know what I mean? Right? So, but it's a, an important question. Depression is a difficult one. Very difficult. I hope this at, at, um, at least gives some sense, and I'm sure you also have definitely some ideas of how to deal with it. Yeah. Yes, please? Yes? Yes? Oh. <laughs> okay, um, there's a sister upstairs. Yes. Is, she's sharing her experience that the uh, dependent origination is well described in the Rice Seedling Sutra. Ah, yes. So in the Rice Seedling Sutra by the Buddha, dependent arising, especially dependent arising from the point of view of causes and conditions, is very extensively described. Yes, so absolutely, uh, it is definitely dealing with the first level of dependent arising very extensively, very beautifully. And you're so fortunate to have Geshe Yuntin, who's just given, I believe, very extensive classes and explanations on that. And if you had the fortune to be here, great. Uh, if you didn't, well, there are recordings, so there's always a possibility to look into that. Yeah. Okay. Anything else? And Geshe Doji Damdula will also, also a wonderful, wonderful teacher, also have had the great fortune, both Geshe Yuntin is my teacher and Geshe uh, Doji Damdula, they're both my teachers, so I've had the great fortune to receive teachings from them and you have too. So Geshe Doji Damdula, he will give the same topic, the teaching on the Rice Seedling Sutra in Deer Park in October and you can probably find it online. Mm -hmm. Yes. Anything else? Okay, excellent. So he's actually the advisor of this center. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> so you're in very good hands. <laughs> yeah. I didn't know that, but yeah, thanks for telling me. More questions on anything we've done so far or anything further than that? Yes. <laughs> Okay, Kishma, thank you very much for your very clear teachings. I'm just wondering about the, uh, your point mm -hmm. about seeing the same object. Mm -hmm. when, we see, when we look at the same object, mm -hmm. all of us have different perspectives. Mm -hmm. yeah? mm -hmm. So um, my question would be, how do we ascertain the reality of things? No? Because mm -hmm. it's all based on different perspectives. 
But I do know there's nothing objective from there. Mm. So I'm not sure how to reconcile that. Mm. Yeah, thank you. This is very difficult. You're getting right to a very difficult question and I'm hoping to address this. But you're right. Actually, it makes sense to us, doesn't it? That right now, for instance, when you look at me, you see something I have never seen in my entire life. <laughs> my own face. The mirror image of my face is not my face. And a photograph is not my face. I can only see, so I'm lucky I have like a longish kind of nose. I can see the top of, tip of my nose when I, you know, look at it. But other than that, I've never seen my own face. So you all see something I've never seen, but I see something you have never seen. So basically, even right now, from the point of view of perspective and many other factors, we all see something unique. Okay. So we all have a subjective perception of reality. So if there's only something subjective there, does that mean it's like the mind only school, there's only mind and there's nothing out there? Well, that we need to look at. Because that's a very difficult question. Very difficult question. And I don't really want to go into an explanation because otherwise tomorrow or the day after we're <laughs> <laughs> no, we'll definitely address exactly that issue and there's more to it. There's more to it. But it's already a challenging point. If we just all have different perspectives, in the end is there only mind and there's nothing there. Right? That's what it seems like. Okay? Is there a table? Is there blue? Are there all these objects? Okay. And the answer is yes. The answer is yes, but not objectively. So maybe just one way of looking at it, what is reality? It is the summary of what we perceive, right? And of course is the mode of existence of all these phenomena, which it's also perceived, maybe by some of us, if you have understood the ultimate nature of phenomena, but definitely by highly realized beings. And we get into that. It's a little bit difficult. But this far, important question. We can all agree that we see some part, but is there something extra than that? Is there or is there not? Can it be found or not? Yeah? All right. But we'll talk more about this tomorrow. So I hope... We can do it tomorrow. Okay. Anything else? <laughs> I know it's a long day. Yes, yes, I know. No, if you don't have questions, we can also leave it. Or I'll ask you a question. No, 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 I'm kidding. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. <laughs> okay, so are you sure if it's not shyness? I mean, if you if you feel like that's it for today, you are or enough. But let me just wrap it up one more time, just that you know before we leave that uh, what we've been talking about. We've talked about the fact that it is our perception of reality that gives rise to our emotions, which unfortunately many of them are distorted as in like exaggerated responses as a result of for instance, our sense of self. I mentioned mainly this, the, the I. How we exaggerate the importance, self-centeredness, exaggerating any harm or benefit, and then leading to those emotions. And basically seeing that is this misperception that gives rise to those emotions that are, excuse me, um, potentially very harmful. So... Already from the way I put it forth with selfishness and so forth, we can already see it's definitely an exaggerated sense of a self. And now stepping away from the self, we haven't brought it together. Dependent arising and the self, we haven't brought it together yet. I took a step backwards and just said, I'll give you a coarse explanation of what dependent arising refers to. So that phenomena such as people, such as situations, they are the result of certain main causes and secondary conditions. 
they are not partless. They are made of many different things other than themselves. That is dependence on parts or characteristics and, and moments in time, all described as parts. And then they're dependent on perception, on being perceived. Right? So, having learned this basic idea of dependent arising, then let's take the first part, how we can, by just understanding that everything, every person, every situation has causes and conditions that brought this situation about, therefore, if we encounter an obnoxious person, for instance, who we usually react with anger towards, or a person who's difficult or violent, how maybe without outwardly allowing them to go along with what they're doing, but our heart can at least open to them with the wish for them to be free from the suffering they have, from the suffering they create. Um, and as a result of understanding the causes and conditions or having some idea, having some sense that there are certain causes and conditions that made them who they are. And therefore, instead of seeing them as purely evil, as naturally evil, instead perceiving them as lovable, as being, as being just like us, but having these negative uh, characteristics because of their environment they grew up in, the way they were raised, uh, the situations they went through, and therefore generate real compassion. Does that make sense? Yeah. So this is what we've been talking about, and I've asked you to put this into practice. Uh, tomorrow, when you're... No, I won't say again. <laughs> okay, going off into the great practice ground. Right? Eight hours of opportunity to put this into practice. Wonderful. Okay, great. Now it's uh, 10 minutes before 9.30, so I think it's time enough. Let's leave it at that. I don't think there are any more questions. If there are, we can continue tomorrow. And um, so as I said earlier on, we started off with uh, setting the motivation. Also very important at the end is to dedicate whatever positive potential. So from a Buddhist point of view, we have accumulated positive actions here, just sitting here together, reflecting upon uh, the causes that give, or the, the, uh, the causes that can give rise to love, compassion and so forth. So already moving in that direction. Um, so whatever positive potential we have accumulated today, may that become the cause, may it not go wasted, but may it become the cause so we can continue to develop our mind, to transform our mind, to get to know our own mind, to become a more compassionate, a kinder person, so that one day we be like His Holiness the Dalai Lama, giving people what they need, when they suffer, when they have difficulties. And if we wish to do so even further, to become fully enlightened, like His Holiness probably is, like a fully enlightened Buddha, and to be able to be of greatest benefit to all sentient beings. Okay. So with this in mind, let's do the dedication prayer. Sonam can lead us.